All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elisha Rogers, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Educator with Purdue Extension in DeKalb County in Indiana, so very nor almost very northeast Indiana. And it's my pleasure today to be hosting our monthly um, small ruminant webinar with the Purdue Extension small ruminant team. And we have with us today Matt Asmus. He is a PhD graduate student at Purdue University with a great background in um, nutrition. So we're excited for him to talk to us today about um, strategies for our you and Liam nutrition. So Matt, I'll let you take it over. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and so like she said, Matt Asmus here, uh, glad to keep this relatively open in terms of question and answer as we go forward. Um, originally from Southwest Michigan, uh, raise quite a few sheep there. We run about 350 to 400 ewes, um, mainly for the club lamb type market, for, for the show sheep side of things. Um, do extensive AI and embryo transfer work. Uh, today we're gonna talk specifically about nutrition, um, specifically pre-breeding uh, through gestation, late term gestation, and then a little bit as we transition into the early lamb, and essentially through the end of weaning. Uh, that's kind of the, the talk for today, if, if everybody wants to go with me. Um, I prepared some slides, um, but I, like I said, I want to keep it relatively open forum. So if anybody has questions as I'm going, please feel free to stop me. Uh, just interrupt me in the middle, or I, there may be a button where you can raise your hand or whatever. Um, and if you know, I'll ask Elisa if you see some people raise hands or have questions in the chat, maybe notify me as we go. If you don't feel comfortable talking, you know, if you want to type out the question in chat, but but feel free to stop me. Um, we've got an hour slated here today. It's not going to take me a full hour to probably get through this, um, but I, I want to have good questions and answers on the backside. So please feel free uh, if anybody has questions let it be known and we'll we'll work through it. So that being said, the, the topic of the talk, right, is strategies for you and lamb nutrition. There's four key areas, I guess, that I'm gonna focus on here today. Like I said, so pre-breeding, trying to get those ewes in shape uh, ahead of time. So, you know, when we think of how this works throughout the duration, it's important nutrition year round, right? But specifically when we talk about reproductive efficiency, Pre-breeding is, is a key time. Uh, fetal uh, and during gestation, so nutrition to that ewe while she's pregnant uh, for that roughly 150 days. Then the first 24 hours immediately after birth, and there I'm focusing mainly on the baby, not as much on mom. And then during that nursing or suckling period while the lambs are still on the mom. So whether that's you know a 60, 90, 120 day wean age, depending on how you guys do things in your system. The one key thing that I wanna start off with here again is there's no one right answer in how things absolutely have to be done, right? So I'm gonna give you guys different recommendations. There's a lot of different ways to have these things done and there's no one most correct way, right? There's a lot of options that can fit different systems depending on what your facilities are. So I don't want anybody to get discouraged and say, man, what I do is completely different than what he's talking about or what he recommends. Understand that there's a lot of right ways to do things. I'm just gonna go over some of the common ways that, that I do things and some ways that have been done in the industry. That doesn't mean they're the only way to accomplish those goals, right? So don't get discouraged if this is way different than, than the type of system you guys have or, or in place at your place. Uh, so pre-breeding, um, to me, reproductive success starts well before conception. Uh, so in our case, we give all of our pre-breeding vaccinations four to six weeks prior to either artificial insemination or exposing for natural live cover. Um, in this case, we, we go, you know, obviously I'm not a veterinarian. You wanna to defer to your veterinarian for vaccination protocols. But in this case, Parvo, Lepto, um, uh, some different Camphlobacter jejuni, fetal jejuni, Bactrin, different things that we vaccinate for pre-breeding. Use of teasers if you're trying to hit a specific lambing time. So 
depending on what type of sheep you're running, right? Whether it's white face, black face, and whether they're seasonal or non-seasonal breeders, um, we like to utilize teasers to make sure they start to come into estrus prior to. Uh, and all of this goes together. I know the topic is nutrition today, but I'm kind of going to work through a few different things because uh, I think they work uh, together, right? It's not just nutrition. It's not just vaccine programs. It's the combination of those things that kind of make all this work together. And if we miss out on some, we may have problems reproductively. Nutrition obviously is a huge role in that, but there's other things that get, that get involved as well. So a key one here when we talk about nutrition is trying to get use on what I call a positive plane of nutrition. By doing that, we're going to naturally increase the occurrence of multiple births. And again, depending on what type of genetic line you're running, uh, you may have a higher incidence of multiple births already, right? So fin sheep are very, very prolific and can have litters. And you can go the other end of the spectrum with more like Suffolk type sheep that will have more, way more common to have single births. What I use is mainly hemp crosses. Uh, we're looking to try and get twins out of the majority of those if, if we can do it, right? Two big reasons. Um, so you're paying to feed that you uh, the same input cost essentially for the year, whether she has one baby or two babies, right? So economically, it makes a lot more sense if she can raise two babies from a financial standpoint, you want her to have multiple births. Similarly, it also reduces the birth weight as a general rule, right? So two fetuses, they're gonna be of smaller average size than one large singleton birth, right? So multiple reasons to wanna to try and have multiple births. Putting those use on a positive plane in nutrition is what we call a natural flush. Uh, and essentially what we're saying there is if, if resources are plentiful, so they're in good condition, they're on an uphill plane, right? So they're gaining weight pre-breeding, they're way more likely to ovulate multiple follicles and then can, you know, theoretically then have multiple births. That's the goal. Um, a key one here in this pre-breeding window is free choice mineral, uh, especially those on pasture. So again, depending on what your situation is, whether they're pasture raised or whether they're more in a confinement type setting where you're actually bringing uh, their nutrient source to them, free choice mineral is always recommended. Uh, it, it plays a huge role in conception as well as uterine development and a lot of other things as we as we prepare for placental development for the baby. So we wanna make sure that we have a, a good source of free choice mineral. And again, one, whether it's goat sheep, making sure it's species specific, right? Sheep have a high copper toxicity. Uh, and so trying to make sure, uh, and that's probably not shocking to anybody here, right? But that's something that's really key. Um, sometimes we get, uh, people that want to feed multi-stock loose mineral. And some of those times, right, even though it may claim it's multi-stock, we want to make sure we check that copper level, especially in sheep, no greater than 15 parts per million uh, when we talk about copper level uh, in sheep. And now, again, that may tie a little bit with molybdenum, uh, which helps bind and tie that copper. Uh, but so free choice mineral, especially those that are on pasture, right? So they're out foraging. I'm from Michigan originally. We're selenium deficient in our soil. Uh, we have deficiencies in the dirt, right? So if there's deficiencies in the dirt, there's deficiency in the pasture. So making sure we have a good source of free choice mineral, especially those used on grass, is key to try and make sure we're at as high of a peak performance for reproductive success as we can get. Now, I'm going to shift gears and go into fetal nutrition during gestation. And, and if I'm to back up that pre-breeding, right, positive plane of nutrition, but not too fat, right? The goal is not to get them so over-conditioned that then we're going to cause uh, problems down the road. You can get them too heavy, right? So there's a fine line here. We want a positive plane of nutrition in terms of they've weaned off, dried down. Now we're bringing them slowly back up in a positive state not to where they're so heavy that at the end, we're gonna get them ketotic and then they're gonna have poor milk production and performance in lactation. So trying to work them on that positive plane of nutrition without going skyrocket, right? So think of a gradual increase, not a mountain climb, right? So that's kind of how we wanna work those use, slowly up 
into better condition all the way to parturition. That's kind of how we want to think of that process. So if we talk about fetal nutrition during gestation, okay? So if you think about it, this is the initial nutrition that the baby lamb in utero is gonna see, right? So that lamb is fully dependent on nutrition from her mom, his or her mom, right? right? Those singles or twins inside the ewe. So maternal nutrition has a large impact on sur survivability and subsequent growth rate of offspring. So typically we're gonna have a larger impact in that case, right? With twins or triplets versus a single. So a U on just okay grass, hay or whatever can usually meet the requirements. When you start to get higher number of births, twins or triplets, the energy demand grows exponentially that's put on that U, right? So making sure she's fed correctly throughout gestation really, really has an impact on birth weight as well as the subsequent survival rate of those offspring, right? If, if she's underfed and the lambs aren't allowed to develop correctly or as large as they will, you're gonna have light birth weight lambs. They're not gonna be quite as vigorous and get up and wanna nurse on their own. And that is a, a problem that we see. So a lot of that, you know, there are other things that can impact it, but nutrition is a huge driver of what's gonna impact that quality of life for that lamb at birth both in terms of size, in terms of quality, and then vigor in terms of getting up and nursing. And when I say quality, I mean ability to be a healthy lamb that can be fed out. <laughs> and so Matt, real we, quick, we do have one question. Absolutely. Um, so the question is, are you saying, it says 1505 of maintenance or how much um, are we looking at feeding grain? How do we get that weight up to a, a more suitable letter level leading into that breeding? Sorry, 1505. I'm, can you read it one more time? Yeah, this is from Brian. So are you okay. saying um, 120%? There we go. Are you saying 120% of their regular maintenance diet or how much should you increase um, their diet, um, how much they're getting? Um, using grain, using forages, how should we safely yep. get their so, weight up? So that's a good question. And I'm gonna get to that in just a little bit, but I'll go over it right now. So, so in the front end, right, it depends a little bit on what your system's like. So if you're feeding pasture, uh, the, the easiest way, right, is to supplement with a concentrate or a grain. And so it's gonna depend a little bit, and we're gonna work through, again, some of this as we go. But knowing whether you have singles, twins, or triplets plays a big, big role in this. Um, ultrasounding, we utilize actually uh, the guys there at Purdue University, Gerald Kelly does our ultrasounding for us. We identify those that are singles, twins, and triplets, and then feed accordingly. In some cases, you're not gonna be able to do that, right? Depending on how many animals you have, whether you're gonna be allowed to have enough pens to split off and feed them separately, right? Segregate and feed separately. The easiest, most common way is to do it with a grain or a concentrate supplement. And then it's gonna depend a little bit on how far behind you are, right? So if you're feeding just a pretty poor hay, yeah, you may need to add one pound roughly of a corn soybean meal mix uh, to get close enough to where you need to be. Um, and so, yeah, if they're on half a pound, maybe you need to double that to one pound. And it, again, it depends a little bit. We do it more in pounds per head per day than, than in terms of 20%, just because I don't know what everybody's on on the, on the front end. But so if you're feeding about a half a pound of grain, that's what we do. Uh, we like to keep them on coccidia stats, make sure to use our diet is balanced so that they get their full VTM dosage through a grain supplement source. I have it calculated so that they'll get that full amount through a half a pound per head per day of grain. So if they need to go up, then I'll work upwards to like a pound. And if they have triplets, I like to go closer to a pound and a half. So, right, so one baby, a half a pound, two babies, one pound, three babies, a pound and a half. That's kind of the logical way. That's not a great math equation, I guess, for anybody, but that's kind of how we do it. Hopefully that answers the question. And then VTM real quick, I'm guessing that means vitamins and trace minerals. Is that correct? Yes, sorry, yes. So VTM yep. is vitamins and trace minerals. Absolutely. Yep. All right, and so that's key when we talk about 
it's really important, right, when we have loose mineral, but then the vitamin trace mineral pack that comes through the grain source, uh, it's key for some of those minerals to be fed, like I said, pre-breeding and then through gestation. If, if you're short on some of those, you can have problems with uterine dilation and then have birthing problems down the road and create a problem uh, as well as you can have bone growth development potentially as well if calcium phosphorus levels are not correct. But so all those things play together, calcium phosphorus as well as those vitamins and trace minerals have a large impact on uterine development and then their ability to dilate naturally and have a normal birth versus having to have uh, an intervention by the shepherd uh, or flock manager in this case to get those burrs or worse yet, a veterinarian to try and get those things out healthy and safely. Okay, thank you, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. So if we talk about, uh, again, average gestation length, 145 to 150 days, I figure about 146 on my end. I like to make sure they come into my lambing barn before they lamb. Right, so we figure 146, we try to have them in at least two weeks prior to their lambing date. And again, this is gonna vary a lot depending on your guys' situation. I'm lambing in December and January in Michigan. It's very cold, there's snow, little baby lambs don't do great in that. I have a heated lambing barn. So I bring everything in. Obviously that's not the case in most situations. I do something very specialized. If you're lambing in March, April, May, whatever, obviously you can pasture lamb if it's nice enough. If they have a shed or lean to, you can do that. The big thing here is if we talk about uh, early on, and I don't know if I have a pointer here that you guys can see. Uh, early on the utter development you see for the first 60 days, there's not a lot of placental or fetal growth early on. So the nutrient requirement of those used for that first 60 days of pregnancy isn't that high it really starts to ramp up at about day 90. So 50 days roughly prior to parturition, their energy requirement's gonna start to ramp up as the placental uh, development and need grows, as well as the fetus. So the majority of the fetal weight is actually gonna occur in the last 45 days, right? And, and even less than that, a, a lot of it's gonna occur in the last three weeks. So that's where, if you've seen ewes that get catotic or have signs of ketosis, right? Which, um, what is a good way? Pregnancy toxemia is another term for that. Ones that go downhill and like can't barely get up, right? They just, they're, they had been fine and then they just start to struggle to get up. That's because we're not meeting their energy demand, right? So they've got a huge draw in their system and this gets even higher, right? This, this draw, this curve is even steeper if we've got multiple births, right? So if they're trying to grow two and three fetuses, the draw on the, on the maternal dam or the mom is huge. And so trying to make sure we, we are able to get enough resources in terms of nutrients into that U, and, and I'll work forward here into the next slide, um, but there's a, large, uh, there's a large draw on her, and it, it gets even more so when you consider the fact that the, the babies, are gonna start occupying more and more of that space that would have been able to fill with the rumen, right? So you're trying to get more and more energy and nutrient density into the diet so she can intake less pounds because she's got less room to do it, but her need for it's even more. So that's where it gets really tricky is in late gestation um, because the babies just occupy so much of a percentage of the internal capacity of those ewes and similarly with goats as well. Um, so again, the placenta plays a huge role in terms of fetal uh, nutrition, right? So we're going to transfer nutrients specifically from the dam to the offspring. Um, it's a key transporter of selenium to offspring. Again, we're selenium deficient here. We give in, uh, shots of supplemental selenium to prevent white muscle disease in sheep. Um, that's a selenium deficiency, something we want to try to avoid. Um, it can also affect uh, newborn vigor and survivability. 90% again of that placental growth has occurred by day 90 of gestation. So late gestation nutrition, like I was just talking about, is one of the most important reasons for a bunch of reasons. Uh, we have the increased risk of ketosis. Uh, and in that case, right, 
ketotic or pregnancy toxemia, in that case, we have a chance of losing the babies and the mom. And so that's a really bad place that we don't want to get to, right? And so if you remember when I said on that slow positive plane of nutrition, if we get them too big early and they're too too heavy early, those ewes want to start to, to slack off on feed and try and metabolize and use their body reserves and stores and don't want to eat enough late gestation. That's when we get a lot of these ketotic type problems, right? So we've got two and three lambs because we got them. Remember I said uh, a, a maternal flush, right? Or a natural flush. So we've got them heavy. They have two or three babies and we let them keep eating at that pace and don't bring them back. They keep going, they get heavy. Now we've got triplets in there. She's running out of room internally to be able to intake enough. And if that feed stuff is not of a high enough quality, we start to run into problems. So I don't know how many of you do this. I'm pretty guilty of not always doing a great job of this, of, of evaluating our incoming feedstuffs is a really important thing. So I'm always feeding grain with mine. So I'm, I'm somewhat limited in my risk because I know at least a portion of what they're getting is a fixed nutrient density. Um, but if you're feeding pasture only or just hay, uh, it's a good idea, right? So hay quality can vary immensely. So whether it's first cut, second cut, third cut versus grass, Timothy, blends of alfalfa grass, Timothy orchard grass, right? There's a, a huge variety. Brome's not as common here, but it is more in the West. There's a huge variety in terms of hay type and hay quality. And even then the same stand of field that was the same blend in 2018, because of environmental conditions with rain, et cetera, may not be the same in 2019, right? So to say that, well, everything in that field was okay last year doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be okay this year. So it's a relatively inexpensive test to get, uh, to at least get TDN, total digestible nutrients, to look at some of the energy, and then at bare minimum, maybe crude protein. And if, if you don't wanna try and read through all of it, they do a nice job of putting what they call an RFV or the relative feed value on hay stuffs. You can kind of look at that relative feed value and get an idea, at least a broad idea that incorporates a majority of those components into a relative feed value. And it gives you a rough idea of where you need to be in terms of, of quality. I feed some stuff in lactation. The, the goal is to save the very best hay for during lactation, because their, their nutrient demand is the absolute highest during lactation, okay? So if you think of it right, if you've got a couple different kinds of hay, you wanna feed just kind of okay hay early, right? And then if you use some supplement to get a, a small flush to increase twins, you can feed that through mid gestation. Late gestation, you wanna may feed just a slightly better hay, still not your best, right? Save that for lactation the best stuff in lactation. And then I like to feed the very worst right before pre-weaning. So trying to shut those use milk production back down before babies get weaned. And again, I'm weaning babies very early at 60 days of age. So try not to, because if we overfeed, we gotta be careful here to slow their milk production back down. If not, you can actually cause problems in subsequent lactations. You can actually ruin the bag on some of those use, right, because of that. So we gotta be careful a little bit in, in terms of that, if that makes sense. Um, so trying to come back here, uh, late gestation nutrition, again, is important. It's gonna affect birth weight. It's gonna affect survival rate based off of that birth weight. It's also gonna affect colostrum yield, right? So if she's hungry and depleted, she's not gonna be having a bunch of extra energy to put into milk production and into high quality colostrum, which is absolutely what we wanna do. Um, if those babies are smaller, right? Theoretically, they're more likely to have a reduced pre-wean growth rate. They're not gonna be as large when they come out. They're not gonna be as strong and vigorous. They're not gonna take off and have as good of a start in that suckling phase. They, they can compensatory gain some, but potentially, theoretically, the, the pre-wean growth rate should still be reduced in those cases, which results then in lower wean weights which if we're, you know, the ultimate goal here is to still make money and sell offspring. Uh, and so those lower wean weights is a direct correlation to income. And so 
that late gestation nutrition is very, very important as we talk about the foundation of going forward with those with those offspring into the spring or into the whatever time of year, if you're trying to hit the Easter market or wherever you're trying to sell those babies into. And similarly, for even for replacement stock, right? We want those things to have as good of a start as we can for long term success for future generations of those offspring. Again, we, I've talked about this here, so I won't I won't go too far down this path, but use carrying those multiple pregnancies again, have limited capacity, right? Um, it's hard to get them to intake enough energy. So even in my system where I'm feeding grain, we can get used that get catotic. Um, it's 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 really key if you have the ability to split those ones that have multiple pregnancies and feed them differently than the singles. That's a good way to do it. It, it really and truly is. I know it's a lot more work, but ideally that's the way we would go through it. Um, you can increase energy and this is a common theme and it, it can happen. Right? So you can increase energy to everybody. The only downside to that is the ones with singles are going to have increased birth weights. So you may have a slightly higher risk of, of dystocias or lambing problems that you'll have to intervene with. Was there a question there or? Okay, I thought it looked like you were gonna stop me. Um, sorry. So again, most common way is to increase that energy in late gestation with grain. However, it can be done with a higher quality forage or if you're pasturing and then moving them to a dry lot, right? If you're in a dry lot situation and say you've got a fixed amount, say you're giving four pounds per head per day of a dry hay source, you can up that right to five or six pounds. Again, that's gonna depend on what your nutrient analysis of that hay looks like. As long as they're able to eat and consume that extra 25 to 50% hay, that is a way to do it. In late gestation though, right? We know we're working off a limited space, if it's if it's long stem hay, better. In my case, we feed some corn silage. They come into a room and fill problem, right? High quality hay, they don't get quite as full as like a corn silage situation. So you probably can increase that to maybe five or six pounds per head a day of hay. And that's again, if I'm you know weighing it out and feeding in bales, small squares, etc. Some may have it in in a free choice situation, right? So like. The picture at the very beginning with a, a hay feeder with a big square bale or a round bale, allowing ad libitum access to that is not a not a bad thing either, right? Again, there's a lot of ways to achieve this, and there's no one exact right way. These are all kind of just thoughts to think about as you as you worry about if you run into problems and trying to prevent problems in the future as we go forward. Matt, real quick, um, so would you recommend feeding for Kind of your, I guess, say smaller producers, would you recommend corn silage or would you recommend haylage? Um, what would you recommend if you're looking at a forage side of it? What would be a better option? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're in a dry lot situation, um, I don't know as though there's one right way. I like to feed corn silage with as many uses we have. Cost effective wise, it's a lot cheaper. Hey, I'm sure a lot of you on here that have sheep and goats can feel my pain here. Uh, the cost of quality hay right now is astronomical. Um, and there's a huge variation. Again, that's because of the variation in quality. Um, I can buy big round bales of first cut that were put up relatively marginal for maybe $120 a ton. Some of my fifth cut premium alfalfa that's coming from Kansas by the time it gets freighted here is $380 a ton. So there's a huge variation in hay quality and price. At that type of price, right, it makes it not so cost effective to try and raise livestock. The nice part that I can do with with corn silage in our case and the way we do it, I can lock in a year's worth of supply in an ag bag outside. The quality stays good. I don't have to worry about a bunch of, of barn space, right? So to fit as much hay as I would need for 400 ewes, I would need a massive hay shed. Um, we've got one that's pretty large now that we keep as much as we can in, but the reality is, you know, if I'm feeding four pounds per head per day, um, I can feed a ton of hay a day. So I need 365 ton for a year. Um, and just logistically, that's a lot to try to fit 
in a barn space wise, right? That's a big overhead cost. Whereas I can put silage up for about $2,000 worth of ag bag. I can chop it and the cost per ton by the time it gets bagged. Now corn price is high. So artificially skewed a little bit, right? But like say last year, I chopped 25 acres of corn silage and that was about $12,000 versus it would have been closer to $40,000 in hay. So in my case, it works to justify it. Now, the downside of that is I have to feed enough off the face of that silage every day to prevent it from, from rotting. So if you don't have the ability to utilize it fast enough, corn silage can be really tough to manage. Um, there are also some other things that come with it. You can have a chance for some listeriosis. That can happen. Um, sheep are somewhat susceptible to that, and that can be an issue. Uh, it can be treated right with tetracycline if you catch it early enough. But so there are some limitations to feeding corn silage, right? I mean, there's there's cost benefits, and then there's also downsides, right? So I don't know as though I'd say there's one absolute best way to do it. Cost effectively, uh, corn silage or a TMR type situation, total mixed ration like that is the the cheapest route to go usually with hay prices the way it is, but if you own your own fields of hay, right? I think hay is, sheep do really, really well on hay. I mean, there's no way to deny that. So a good hay qual quality hay is probably still like the, the quote unquote standard, I would say, if you can. Cost effectively, it's not always the cheapest. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, because that's there's some play there in terms of how that, that fits. Certainly. And then we had one other question come in real quick. So in a recent goat chat, um, Jennifer Bentley, who's in Iowa, was talking about BHB or ketone monitoring. Um, so do you use ketone monitoring on in your own facility or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I do not. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how that monitoring works. Um, is I don't know if they do that on an individual basis. I'm I'm assuming on an individual animal basis. I'm not exactly sure how else they would monitor that. Um, so I'm not bear with me because I'm not familiar with that. Um, we do not currently do anything like that. Most of it's on a visual appraisal uh, with that many head, right? Um, we try to just do a really good job managing that standpoint. I'm not saying that that's not a bad thing. Uh, I'm not exactly sure the cost of that either in terms of what that ketone monitoring system looks like. But I think, you know, any type of technological advancement like that is a good thing if the cost is justifiable, right? So if we can manage and justify the cost of that, um, I think that that it could be a useful technology potentially. But again, I'm not apologize. I'm not familiar with that enough to probably make a honest assessment if I'm being full transparency. Yep. So from what I've seen, what I've read, um, a lot of it it is easier um, with a smaller herd or smaller flock to be able to do that because it looks like you are pretty much monitoring each individual animal. Um, yep. So it's more using kind of those ketone strips you can buy in the store um but just monitoring those levels which would be good for a smaller herd um if you're especially if you have several does if you're raising like a nigerian dwarf that typically has multiple multiples <laughs> um, like we had a friend that had six the other day from one doe um so wow. something like that i could definitely see a smaller herd utilizing that tool so yep okay good so so, right, great technology to have. I think it has obviously places for that. Um, and as long as you can justify the cost, again, I'm not, if they're ketone strips, they're probably relatively inexpensive. Um, but still, yeah, for me, that would be 400 tests a day or however often we do that. So that would be pretty tricky. But but I think, like you said, in, in a situation like that, depending on your setup, or, you know, even if it is a large setup and you're, you've got some that are suspect that you have questions on, maybe that's a good way to reassure yourself in terms of, hey, here's what I think I'm seeing. We can use a ketone test and, and check her and say, that's what it is versus is there some other type of intervention that needs to happen? Is she, you know, does she act like more like she has hardware? Does she have some other type of problem as opposed to knowing, hey, 
like I said, just a secondary reassurance that it is ketosis and maybe you need to sort that one off and feed her differently and, and separate her off from, from the rest of the group. Yep. Good question. Okay. I'm going to move forward to the next one. So energy requirements. So we were talking earlier. Um, I knew that if Dr. Rickert was going to be listening in, I better make sure to use a little bit of data at least. Uh, so this is from the nutrient requirements of small ruminants from 2007. Uh, so if you look here, uh, if we've got energy requirements in this case, again, I'm a sheep guy. I apologize. I didn't include much with goats. I, I do more with sheep, but, but the principles and the thought process of this is exactly the same, regardless of goats versus sheep. Um, so if we look at maintenance here at a 1.52 pounds of TDN a day, breeding at a 1.67, right? We ramp up in early gestation to a 2.16 and then all the way up at a 2.9 in late gestation, right? So what those users were requiring their maintenance level at 1.52, we're almost double that in late gestation, okay? So there's a, there's a big energy need and demand versus just a sheep on grass in the summer that's open versus one in late gestation, right? Nearly double. So again, if we were trying to expect her to forage that or to find, you know, say it was requiring her five pounds of just average hay to meet her requirements, now she needs to intake 10 in late gestation, right? To offset that. So that's why a lot of times we'll use a concentrate or a grain because we just can't get the intakes high enough in late gestation. And then if we look at lactation, it jumps up even higher to a 3.15. And that can even be slightly higher with multiple births, right? So if she's milking twins, that draw or demand could be slightly higher yet. And this is this is actually with twins, so that's a bad example. It's exactly 3.15 with twins. But and again, we have triplets. We try our best not to let ewes try and raise triplets. We try and graft them onto other ewes, uh, or we do have a milk machine for artificially rearing. We try not to do that as much as possible. Um, we prefer them to have mom's milk. And I'll I'll get to that point here in a minute about colostrum and how some of that I think plays a role. Uh, but so, but a brief look here, right, at roughly what a what energy requirement would look like. Not surprisingly, right, protein requirement falls right in line. So a 0.22 for maintenance, 2.5 in breeding, ramps up into late gestation. And then if we look at lactation, there's even a larger discrepancy here right, for uh, total pounds per head per day of protein intake. So we need 0.73 pound, pounds per day of protein, right? So to get there, if we were feeding 10 pounds of hay, that was a good source of 20% protein, right? So 10 pounds of that is essentially two pounds, uh, excuse me, so yeah, two pounds of protein. So that would get you there but not all hay is gonna be that high and they're not gonna eat 10 pounds, right? They may eat four or five pounds. So if we're feeding five pounds of a 20% protein hay, now we're at one pound and we're meeting that requirement, but that's a really good quality hay, right? So again, an easier way to do that is to give a pound or two of a 16%, 14 to 16% concentrate grain. Uh, again, I like that because we can get our vitamins and trace minerals in there. Now, the downside of that is it comes with additional cost, right? So there's different ways to look at this. Um, and as we go forward, I'll talk a little bit more about kind of, I see three different ways of how, how to feed them in lactation, right? So I'll, I'll get to that here in a minute, but just giving you an idea of what the protein and energy requirements look like. Similarly, uh, mineral requirements, looking at calcium and phosphorus, not surprisingly, uh, gestation and lactation requirements for calcium and phosphorus is substantially higher than at maintenance and at time of breeding, right? So, so when we talk about those free choice uh, minerals, as we talk about calcium and phosphorus, both in quality sources of hay and forage, as well as some of those VTMs that we're going to put in a concentrate, it's, it's just important to remember where some of those need to be. So again, trying to look at a little bit of a difference of energy requirements. I did put one in here with goats. Uh, so 1.96 with a single, 2.22 with twins and 2.35 with triplets. Similarly in sheep, 2.31, 2.9 and 3.2 singles, twins or triplets. So again, if we're talking about TDN or energy requirements, 
based off of whether single twins or triplets make a difference, there's a really good explanation, right? So that's that's essentially 50% 50, 50 higher, right? So if we look at a single sheep at 1.3 and one raising, uh, carrying triplets in late gestation, that's almost 50% higher, right? So 150% the value to, to come back to Dr. Rickard's question there earlier, whether it's 20% more with triplets, we're actually up to 50% more. So 150% the energy requirement. So that does give you a nice idea, I guess, of where you're at. Hay nutrition, again, we talked about considering having analysis done on the hay you're feeding. This is, again, like I say, kind of one of those do as I say, not as I do type things. I'm not always the best about it. When it comes to the lactation hay, I always look at hay quality. When we're buying in that expensive hay, I'm looking at relative feed values on every single load that's coming in. So it's a lot easier if you're purchasing hay to ask your hay supplier to provide an analysis of the hay that you're going to buy. Um, I think it's relatively commonplace, especially with higher end, higher quality hay. It's a little tougher, right? If you're raising it yourself, that kind of falls back on you then to have to do the analysis, find somewhere where you can get it done, a trusted source to, to get those done. And there's a lot of different labs. If, if somebody has questions, we could, I can steer you in the right direction of some places that I think do a nice job testing and analyzing uh, forage quality. And, and similarly, right, if you're feeding corn, uh, uh, if you're feeding corn silage or hay silage, not just hay, right? It's a good idea to analyze all that. I do get my corn silage analyzed uh, when I when I put it up. I don't always do a good job of reanalyzing it when I get to feeding it, right? Which may be six, nine, ten months later. I do a nice job of trying to analyze it as it incomes. I feel like it doesn't change as much as what hay does in an ag bag, right? Corn silage stays pretty consistent in there. Um, but again, the quality of that corn silage can vary depending on whether you plant, plant brown midrib silage type corn, or I know guys that just straight chop conventional corn, right? That would be nor normally made for corn production. Um, so there's, there's big variations there. And as well as the growing season changes that a lot as well. Um, again, trying to make sure we keep that very best hay during lactation, trying to get the most milk output as we can out of the female to try and increase the, the pre-wean growth rate and, and increase that weaning weight on that offspring, right? So depending on your situation, a lot of times with sheep, those are gonna be terminal type animals that we're gonna sell to the market. So if they wean heavier with lower inputs in terms of creep feed, right, that increases our profitability. So we pay, in my case, we wanna pay a little extra to feed the mom. She can put more into milk to feed those babies versus less in creep feed sometimes. So uh, key here, get help balancing rations to ensure you're feeding enough and not too much, right? So again, we talked about getting those too heavy too early and then causing ketosis late. That's a key thing there. If you have questions, trying to get a hold of a nutritionist to try and help balance that and make sure you're on par with where you wanna be. So the first 24 hours as we transition now into kind of that newborn, uh, I'm going to focus specifically here for a little bit on colostrum. So high quality colostrum is the key to survivability and success uh, for those baby lambs. Uh, for those you don't know, which most of you probably do, the thick yellowish first milk after lambing or kidding, right? Now I'm calling it thick yellow first milk. The, the, the style and what this looks like can vary immensely depending on the you or the dough. Some of it will be so thick that you about can't get it out. and It'll be so dark yellow that you think she's got an infection or something's wrong. That's perfectly normal, okay? As long as it flows, that is a normal colostrum. Some may be the other spectrum of that, right? It may look pretty white and very fluid, more like you would expect milk. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not good colostrum, right? There can be variations in how that looks. And there's there's some variation in terms of maturity, right? Ewe lambs usually don't have the volume or quality of colostrum as what a mature ewe would, right? A mature ewe usually, or mature doe, is gonna have, usually as a general rule, a larger volume and a higher quality colostrum from that standpoint. But that's not a guarantee, that's just a rule of thumb that we normally follow. Um, so what I like to do once they've lambed, 
try to make sure that the teats have good milk flow, right? So I said, if we didn't do a good enough job drying down mature ewes the year before, after they wean a lamb, we can have issues where uh, the street canal that, that connects the milk bag to the teat actually will have a failure. And so it looks like that ewe has a ton of milk. Her milk bag is full, but the milk can't actually reach the teat. So the lamb will nurse and nurse and nurse, and it may look like it's on, but it's actually starving because the, the milk isn't actually in the channel. So it's a good idea just to break the teat free, make sure that they have milk. They also, some ewes will put a very heavy plug in the tip of the teat. And sometimes little lambs aren't able to get that, that plug broke loose. So manually breaking those teats free, and I say breaking them, right? Breaking that plug, making sure that there's flow then the little lambs can go, go ahead and nurse. Some lambs are not gonna be able to nurse, right? So for those that aren't able to, um, in some cases you're gonna need to tube them, right? Or bottle feed, depending on what you're comfortable with. Um, I'm probably over aggressive on that side of things. I, I, you know, when we're having a lot of lambs at one time, it's hard to keep track. You know, we put them in individual jugs so that they go and nurse. But I can't always come back when I have 150 ewes due on one day. I don't always get back to them as frequently as I need to. So sometimes I'll go ahead and tube them and make sure they got good quality colostrum in them. That'll give them time to get up and go and be more vigorous. Make sure they get antibodies from that first colostrum. You know, making sure they get a large enough intake of that supply is a big thing. Um, again, so we talked about mature use usually making more colostrum and of, of higher quality. The volume again is largely affected by nutrition fed in the late gestation, right? So if we underfeed them late, we're not going to get the same volume. Um, you know, ideally, ideally, we would get used into their lambing area at least 14 days prior to parturition. So they're going to, as a general rule, this is a rule of thought that the antibodies that are going to be passed in the colostrum are ones that the ewes have been exposed to. So if they've been exposed to antigens uh, or pathogens in that environment, theoretically, the antibodies they should pass through to their offspring in the colostrum will be formed in that last 14 to 21 days. If the ewes never, you know, she's been in a, a different environment and then you pull her into a lambing barn and she lambs a day later, there may be pathogens in there inside that lambing area that she hadn't been exposed to, so she hasn't formed antigens or antibodies towards that to pass through passively to her offspring. So it's a good idea to try and get those in ahead of time, as well as if it's cold and you're trying to get them in, you don't want to have an accident with them lambing outside anyway. So it's good to have them in uh, in a in a dry dry area at least, so they can have the best chance of success. Right. The first thing we want to go into these lambs is colostrum, not mud from somewhere. Now, in some cases, right, that's unavoidable. They're going to be born in mud and, and that could happen. Ideally, if we can, at least a dry area, right? So it wouldn't have to be a heated barn, right? So if it's a dry spot with good bedding, ewes can obviously succeed and be just fine in that type of situation, but preferably dry. That's the, the key takeaway there probably. Uh, another key thing that we like to do and I think is good practice there are going to be ewes that are going to overproduce colostrum. So there's multiple reasons to collect it. So one is when ewes get really tight bags and those little lambs can't nurse it or kids, that bag becomes swollen, enlarged, and uncomfortable. So taking some of that extra colostrum out makes it easier, right? Because we'll have ewes that that bag gets too tight and the baby wants to nurse, but it hurts mom. And she will kick at them and not let them nurse because even though it's her baby and she loves it, it hurts her to do it. So trying to make sure we get those teats stripped down so that the babies can nurse and it's more comfortable for mom and a kind of a more enjoyable experience for both of them, right? He's The baby's not getting kicked. Mom's happy because it's not hurting her near as much. And then secondarily, there's gonna be times where you're gonna have a you that doesn't have enough colostrum, right? So we can get a long way with milk replacer. Milk replacers come a long way from where it was but it can't necessarily always replace colostrum. Now we do have colostrum replacements. They're relatively expensive and they're still second rate versus mom's milk. So ideally you would have colostrum, right? So if we take that and freeze it, you can keep it up to a year in the freezer uh, with no problem. Thaw that back out and feed it to another newborn 
and get that same type of passive. And then if you need to go on to a milk replacer from that point forward, that baby's got the antibodies that it needed to passively from its mom. Uh, key thing there, make sure not to use a microwave to thaw it. That is a common thing that I see happen. So if we overheat those, we can denature the proteins and we can actually have serious problems with the antibodies that are in there. So some people say you could heat it in a microwave at a reduced temperature. I don't like doing that at all. I would recommend a water bath. So in my case, I put it, you can either use warm water running from a sink or you can put it in a pot. The problem is I wouldn't boil the water, right? So say I've got it in a Ziploc bag, that's the easiest way for me to freeze it. I put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in, and you can uh, take a pot of water and boil it 50, 60 degrees. The problem is, right, a lot of time we wanna get colostrum in them as fast as we can. And so using hotter water gets it thawed faster and you can get it in the baby faster, but lower temperature is probably more ideal for long-term. So it's kind of that fine line. Just try not to overheat it too rapidly. Uh, that's kind of the goal, get it thawed back out and then go ahead and get that in that lamb as soon as possible after that. Matt, Again, I do have one, one question real quick, sorry. Um, absolutely. So this person has heard of using a refract refractometer to check the colostrum quality. Have you heard of this or do you have any thoughts on that? So I have not, but I'm assuming I know what they're looking for. They're looking for IgG antibodies in there. Um, it can be done. Again, it's an added cost and an added step in the process. Um, realistically, by the time I think you get an answer on that, you know, I think it's okay. I don't know as though I see a whole lot of value in that, quite frankly, from my standpoint. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not valuable to some or some people may. If I'm being fully honest, to me, I don't see as much value in it. If I know I got a good quality colostrum out of out of one of the females on the farm, I'm fine feeding that to another one and feeling very comfortable that that's going to be good enough. Um, that being said, if you're you know you can buy colostrum from others. If you're going to do that and buy colostrum and you want to scan that and check it and analyze it before and then have that as a stock in your freezer, I think in that case maybe it would have more value. But if it's one that you collected the colostrum yourself from a U, and you know that, hey, I, I was there as soon as it was born, I took out, you know, say I took out, she had a huge bag, I took out 20 ounces of colostrum, and I gave that baby four ounces of it, and I froze the other 16, you know that's high quality colostrum. You took it out of the U yourself, I feel pretty comfortable and confident, and I've done it for a lot of years and had very good success with no issues using that type of colostrum. That being said, you know, we're scientists here on this call. I like <laughs> technology. I have no problem with trying to use technologies to make us better producers. So if that's the case and, and you feel comfortable with the cost, again, I don't know what that is, um, I'd say go for it. Um, realistically, my goal is hopefully though, I'm not having to do that very often. Hopefully those babies are getting up if I've done my job in late gestation, hopefully they're getting up and nursing on their own and I'm not having to intervene at all, right? My goal is they're getting enough colostrum from mom. It's a high quality, high volume. They're able to get enough from her and I'm not having to interfere at all. That is my goal. Yep. So Brian made the comment that um, usually they use bricks meters and they'll cost about $300 and they do use them in the dairy industry um, quite often, but it's not quite as common in a small ruminant, so. Okay. So mother's milk is preferred option. Secondary would be colostrum from another you on the farm, like I said. Third, and this is where it starts to get different. So third and fourth, and even a fifth option that I didn't list here would be starting to buy colostrum from another flock versus I have heard of people using colostrum from a dairy, right? So those, those dairy farms don't necessarily use colostrum. Right? They can't send it into the marketplace, so they will sell it sometimes. Sometimes you can get it pretty inexpensively. Obviously, the, I, the, the antibodies aren't exactly the same as with sheep, but it's better than not giving them anything. Right, So I didn't list the cattle option, but I do know of people that do that and have seemed to have okay success with it. Um, the key there, <laughs> so if you look where I say third would be colostrum from another ewe flock with similar disease status, right? 
So if we're looking at cattle, we don't want ones that have yonis, right? There's different diseases here. You do not want to introduce a disease or an outside foreign antibody or a foreign disease to your flock, right? That is not what you want to do. Um, fourth would be a colostrum substitute containing IgG. Again, they make these. They're commercially available. They're pretty expensive. I'm thinking they're like 20 bucks, 25 bucks a, a bag for that IgG colostrum. And it's quite frankly, I think it's subpar versus trying to have one of these first two options. That would be the preferred method of doing it. But we've all been in tight situations where you don't really have another option. That is an option, it is viable, and it can be done. Um, again, ideally the lamb will nurse on its own. We've kind of went through all this. I'm gonna, the other key takeaway from this slide here is, when I'm, if I do have to tube one and we intervene, you know, you don't want to tube them with so much that they're so full that they want to just lay there and not get up because they're not hungry, right? Our thought is, hey, I want to get that lamb full and satisfied. The reality is we don't want them so full that they don't want to get up and nurse mom. We need them to get up and learn how to nurse. Moms will paw at babies. They know that naturally they're supposed to get up and nurse. So if, if we don't, we can have problems where moms will paw them too much and break ribs or break legs. We can also have issues where the lambs get dependent on you tubing them and they don't want to get up and nurse because they never have to learn, right? If they just, hey, I can just lay here and in about six hours, they're going to come tube feed me again and life's good. You know, they can get kind of couch potato sheep, right? We don't want that. We don't want lazy ones that don't want to get up and nurse. So what I try to do is two to four ounces, depending on the size of the lamb. And, and usually in that case, then they'll get up and nurse. If not, and you need to come back in three to four hours, and they haven't, you can give a little more, but in that case, trying to hand, by hand, get it started on mom uh, is kind of the way to go. If you are warming uh, milk up that you had frozen, try not to use hot milk, right? So theoretically, right in our head, it seems like, hey, really warm milk will help warm up this little cold lamb. Problem is we can actually cause problems by doing that. So body temperature at the most, Right, so if you've ever milked a you and got colostrum, you can tell you go, man, this really isn't that warm. That's about the ideal temperature to have it at, right? I mean, close to body temperature. Uh, again, there's multiple options available. No one right answer. Um, use can be supplemented on good hay. We've, we've kind of went over this or with concentrate. The last kind of thing here I'm gonna talk about is with creep feeding. So I put up a couple example pictures here. This is what kind of a creep area looks like. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to try and wrap up. So the key takeaway here is if you see the front of this blue feeder here has multiple entry points. Uh, the key thing is there's different ways to do this. You can let the ewe, if she's on hay and a little bit of grain or if she's on just hay, you could not creep feed the babies at all. Let them drink just milk from mom and whatever they're able to forage similar to mom's diet. Second step would be supplementing the ewe with say two pounds of grain per head per day uh, and letting the babies compete, right? If there's enough room and access at the feed bunk, you're feeding the moms. As the babies get older, they'll get up and eat the mom's feed as well. They'll compete with them at the bunk. Thirdly would be look closer to what I do. We have creep areas, um, not necessarily similar to either one of these really, but kind of the, the concept is the same. Uh, an area that's dry, that the babies can get into that the moms cannot, right? So that's up in this blue picture here, the blue gates, that's a self feeder. Uh, you can add, you know, 200 pounds of feed. The babies are able to go in and access that. We don't want moms to go in there and gorge themselves and overeat, right? Because if, hopefully we're up to date on CDT shots, but overeating is a problem in sheep. So that's another key thing to make sure that these babies have been vaccinated for CDT um, because we can have an overeating problem and you can lose lambs from that if you're gonna creep feed hard. Um, so I like to do that, and as well as I like to give them a really good uh, a good hay in there in like a small hay rack or some way. Uh, lambs will actually go to a really good alfalfa before they'll go to creep feed. Um, so trying to keep that away, that's the most expensive hay on the farm usually, right? So making sure just the babies can get to it, don't have to compete with mom. Uh, and then the big thing on creep feeding is once you get them going on it, we I like to try to have enough in there that they don't run out, right? So if you're choring once a day or twice a day, make sure that your feed feeder can hold at least a day's worth so that they're not all going to come in and just gorge themselves for three hours and then run out and be starving again, you know, starving. Sheep can act like they're starving. 
by the next day, right? So that's kind of the key takeaways a little bit on creep feeding. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I'm not saying any's better or worse than any other. Uh, it is, you know, again, dependent a lot on, on what your weaning age is gonna look like. But so that is similar to what one would kind of look like. Having enough access, if you're gonna build creep areas, preferably one that all the babies in a pen can fit in at one time. So that kind of gives you an idea how to size it, right? So if you need an area 10 by 10 with your creep feeder in it, and then all the babies can get away from mom and in there, dropping in a heat lamp or a light source is a good way to encourage them to enter that feeding space um, and, and try and draw them in quicker to the creep feed. So I think that that pretty well finishes up what I've got. Does anybody have questions? I know we're right at time. You're fine. We've got one question here. Um, so it says my relative feed value on a hand analysis I received back says 95. Is that a percentage? And then the crude protein was 12.3%. Um, they're located in central Michigan. What relative feed value do I really want for about 130 pound East Frisian yearling ewe? Okay, so relative feed value, it's it's not necessarily a percent. It's a it's a number that they associate to hay based off of all the other percentages, right? So they'll take crude protein percentage, et cetera, uh, ADF, NDF, different fibers, and then they'll calculate based off of that a relative feed value of what it's worth. So 96 is one that would be like, you know, it's kind of an average quality hay, probably the best way to say that. It's one that could be fed uh, to an open animal that probably was not pregnant or on the front part of gestation. So to give you an idea, when I'm targeting my lactation hay, now again, I'm in a show market world, so it's really the high end. I'm looking for a relative feed value of 200 or higher, which is, is very good hay and is extremely expensive and very, very high end. You don't need that for 130 pound you. That that's that's 96. What did you say the crude protein was? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yep. No, a 12.3 percent. 12.3 percent. Okay. So do you know is that probably more of kind of like a grass based hay, not much alfalfa? I'm guessing. Um, and so that works yeah, really good. Yes, yep. yep. So that would work really good for an open animal or for one that you're trying to dry off or early gestation. When you get to late gestation, you probably would want to, you could still feed that hay, just may want to supplement it a little bit with some grain. Um, Cause that, it would be tough, right? At 12%, at 12.3% crude protein to try and meet your TDN uh, goals with that hay. But it's not a, right? It's not a, it's not a bad hay. Uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of, you know, relative feed value, right? I know that's hard to say. Um, and, and realistically, you know, the way I kind of try to think of it is we'd like to be closer to that 120 is kind of the way I evaluate it. I'd like to have a relative feed value closer to 120 theoretically. And then as we get into late gestation, maybe 140. And then I feed extremely high during lactation because I'm trying to get those things to milk as hard as possible. And realistically, if you're not in a show type setting, there is no need for you to ever buy that type of hay it would be absorbent at cost and it would not have a return. It, it wouldn't be cost effective to ever feed hay that high a quality. There's just, there's really no way to justify it. I know for me, when I look at relative feed value, I kind of think of 100, 100 as kind of a standard, just kind of a good maintenance hay is kind of how I view it. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, you get up to that 200 level and you're looking at basically dairy quality hay at that point. Um, so, like you said, incredibly high quality. It's going to produce a lot of, put a lot of milk um, into that animal to get a lot out. Um, so that's kind of kind of how I look at the, when you break it down by hundreds. That's kind of how I view it. So, yep, and I agree with that. And and the other thing too, right, is cut and fineness of the hay, right? So sheep and goats even really prefer a finer stemmed hay, whether it's grass or alfalfa, right? They prefer fine stemmed as possible, right? You get stockier. First cut is usually stockier than second cut. And so sometimes relative feed value doesn't always, it does take that into account, right? Because it's got fiber component. So that will help evaluate that based off of maturity of the hay. Um, but that is another thing to consider, right? If it's, 
hey, that's a third cut that's at that relative feed value versus a first cut, right? A first cut at that value, probably fine. If you've got a third cut that's really fine stem, that's low fiber, that's still closer to that relative feed value, probably mainly just grass hay, maybe not gonna be quite as high energy as what you're looking for. So there is some variation in, in that number. It's not as good of a job as we try to do to make that a, a one standalone number. It's still not always just by itself that easy. Yep, correct. And that's but what question, at forage, forage quality itself, that could be a whole four hour conversation. So absolutely. And, I, and honestly, I'm probably not the guy to go full enough into that to, to do it. But I think that's a good overview, at least hopefully for you guys here today. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I appreciate you guys joining today to, to listen and visit with us. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, some key takeaway points right as we go forward. Hopefully you learned something here today, if nothing else. Uh, again, not one right way to do things, lots of different ways, but stimulate thought as we go forward. There's always, we're always working on ways to improve and make better within our system of what we try to do. Um, and I'm guessing many of you guys are the same way, wanting to try and get better at what we do, right? That's, we do it because we like doing it, right? So wanting to be good at it and take pride in what we do is a very common theme, I think, across the ag industry, uh, something that makes us proud to kind of do what we do. So uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, if I have any other questions, happy to answer them. I've got one more question or we'll answer real quick. So how long are you typically feeding a high quality lactation diet for that milk production? So in my case, I'm normally feeding that for only 45 to 50 days. So I'm trying to get, and again, I'm very specialized. We're, we're trying to wean those things right at 60 days. So I'll feed it for 45 days, maybe 50, and then I start to drop them down. And that's, a, that's something I didn't cover. If you're gonna feed really hard like I do, and you've got those ewes cranking out milk production, we need to slow them down at the end to not ruin bags. So for two weeks, I'll feed them, I'll take away grain and feed just hay, then I'll pull hay and feed up. I mean, almost straw type hay, as bad as you can get. And then when I'm weaning, I, sometimes I actually will feed straw for the first two days. And then I'll come back and feed a good, just kind of a nice grass hay first cut, just enough to barely meet maintenance, because I do not want them to, to, to hurt their bags and have problems going forward. So I'll feed that, that high end diet for maybe 45 days, 45 to 50, depending on Again, it depends on how grouped up they are, right? I'd love to say if they were all born the same day, but even with my <laughs> AI and embryo groups, they're spread out over a week and they get into different groups. So by the time I get them slowed down, it may end up being 65 to 70 days until I get them weaned. Um, but so I feed 45 to 50 in our world, then we take pictures, right, for the online sales. And then <laughs> we start crashing. I call it crashing the U back down, right? So trying to dry up her bag in most, uh, commercial type situations, that wouldn't necessarily make sense, right? You'd want to keep her going for longer. You probably don't want to wean quite at 60 days unless, you know, the market's really high before Easter and you're trying to get babies to a certain market when you know the price per hundred weight is going to be higher. You know, and in some cases, if you're continuing to feed them all the way throughout, you know, we didn't go into the grow finish type feeding. This is just while they're on their mom, right? There's a whole nother talk that can be had about that. Uh, grow finish type feeding afterwards. So depending on your situation, that duration of, of feed like that can can impact that. Yep, and that's certainly true for, like you said, a, a commercial U type operation. Um, when you're looking at something like the dairy goat industry, um, obviously if you're wanting that milk production to be prolonged, you're gonna wanna keep that high quality feed in front of them for a much longer time frame. so. Yep, and so like she called it, dairy hay earlier, right, or ultra premium, that's that milk, that that hay that's relative feed value of 200, 220, even 240, that really high stuff is what we call ultra premium dairy hay. And you're right, they stay on it a long time. So if you're trying to get milk production out of, out of a dairy goat, feeding that hay longer would be way more advantageous or beneficial because you wanna prolong her milk output as long as you can versus in what I'm doing, I want those babies weaned. I've got them on creep feed then. I'll take them off their mom, let the ewes get back in shape and, and push the babies on grain that direction. But really good question. All right. 
those are all the questions that we've had in today, Matt. So I greatly appreciate your time today. Great information. And thank you all for attending today. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Glad to be here.